Hello and welcome to New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Andrew Weinkopf, who is a Director of Science and Technology at the OECD. Andy, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, you do a lot in the area of the economics of innovation. We've uh, held events together in the past with you. Um, I'd like to get into some very basic issues. Uh, uh, the issue of innovation versus in invention, they tend to be conflated, but I think there are fundamental differences and, and, and they have policy implications. Do you want to comment on that a little bit? Many people, including policymakers, confuse the two. Uh, they frequently focus on invention, which is important, certainly, but a lot of inventions are good ideas that really don't go anywhere, don't generate any growth or productivity gains or employment, which at the end of the day is why we care really about science, technology, and innovation. What innovation does is it takes those inventions and brings them, commercializes them, brings them closer to the marketplace. Frequently, uh, innovations are very incremental. They're not big bang type stuff. It's a small development that proceeds over decades and sometimes to lead to something that you really begin to appreciate and it makes a remarkable difference after that incremental stage is through. Every now and then you get something pretty big. Uh, and of course, in the current era, I guess that's probably the internet, but even that really took two decades before it came into the public. It wasn't just the internet, which goes back to Department of Defense and some of their funding, but it's things like the World Wide Web, which came out of CERN in Switzerland, here in Europe, but also the Mosaic Browser, originally came out of University of Illinois Argonne National Lab. And to me, it was that confluence of those different technologies coming together and around the early to mid 90s that really led to the internet as many of us know it to come to fruition. Uh, but it was, you know, the, the, the private sector engagement with it too. They saw the opportunities, it led to what we call a lot of creative destruction, uh, convergence, what used to be separate networks for uh, voice and for data and for video all coming together. And that has led to some great productivity gains, but a lot of disruption in the marketplace. We need to be careful here because one of the initial responses is how do we slow it down? And how do we stop this? Which was the response of the Luddites in the, the turn of the 19th century. I think that's, that's right. And you see it in some places with what's broadly, it's turned into a verb, the uberization of different services. And I think there's, there's an important role for policy here to play that wouldn't be slowing it down, but to make sure that public policy goals are being achieved when this transformation occurs, meaning high, good jobs, we're protecting people in terms of their benefits and in terms of some, you know, uh, income levels that are what society thinks are, are just here. I, w I want to come back to that point about the uberization of, of jobs because I think you, you, you point out a very key distinction in the innovation process. There's innovation which obviously creates a, a new product, a new invention, uh, whether it be the, the internet or some spin-off of that. But there is also the innovation which might, uh, if you like, effectively arbitrage and, and inefficiency in the economy. Um, you know, which is, I think, what Uber does, actually. And, the, and there's clearly important implications that flow from the, the, the two different types of innovation. No, I think, I think that's, that's right. And uh, efficiency leads to productivity gains, which lead to greater income gains, which then can be redistributed for social goals. And so I think this is something we should try to, try to maintain. Um, and there are inefficiencies that exist out, out there that the new digital economy kind of exposes and this gives an opportunity for entrants to come in and make money by eliminating them. And this, this is a, a good thing. It's just that we need to be careful that as this occurs that we don't end up with destroying safety nets. Uh, Uberization, there's a debate in the United States about the W-2 versus the 1099 economy. Are you self-employed or do you have a, an employer? And in the United States, at least, not across the OECD, a lot of your benefits actually come from your employer. And so in some ways, Europe, where a lot of the benefits come from the state, may be in a better position to handle some of these changes com coming through. And this is one policy area that we'll look at. What about, um, the, the, there's another model which has uh, been discussed. Uh, it's one that was deployed a lot by the Department of Defense in the U.S. in the 1960s and 50s, which was effectively creating the market, which in, in turn induced the innovation. So the de Defense Department would say, I would like you 
uh, General Motors to design, you know, a, a tank with these kinds of specifications. And if you can produce a hundred of them, then we'll, we'll, we'll buy them, and uh, or a, a thousand. In, in effect, creating the market. So they weren't creating winners and losers as such. They were um, uh, creating the parameters for a, a need that was a, a perceived need, and then uh, giving the, the, the companies the market to, in which they could sell. Is that a good model? You know, it's one that's that's growing in pop popularity. It's what we call demand side. Uh, most science, technology, innovation policies are the supply side. We worry about R&D. We worry about the highly skilled scientists, uh, STEM workers, and, and so forth. The demand side doesn't get that much attention. The U.S. actually is a good exception here and tends be, to be for what we call mission-oriented uh, outcomes, things like defense, space, the environment, health care. Um, and you're seeing European countries now begin to use this more, uh, the procurement uh, to uh, pull on, on innovation. I, I think it is a good way. I think, you, again, you need both. The one thing you need to worry about, and I think Department of Defense has been fairly successful at ensuring against this, is the usual problem when you have public officials giving large contracts to make sure that they were done fairly, objectively, and transparently. You want to avoid the, the, the problem of, of cronyism. It seems to me that that would be, you know, we often talk about transitioning to the, the green economy. It seems to me that this would be an ideal area where this kind of model could be used, um, where, where the government, in effect, creates the demand for the innovation, whether it be you know, wind turbines or whatever form of, of, of green technology it takes. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Prizes are another form of this that have been used reasonably successfully. Um, one of the issues we face with green innovation as opposed to the internet and the whole digital e economy is a lot of green innovations require a lot of capital outlay. It's putting in charging systems for electric cars. It's, it's changing over uh, the grid so that it can be smart. And this is a larger scale issue. And here, I think uh, that type of procurement could be helpful. And, 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 and it seems to me that the, the state is the only entity that could do it, 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 in effect, being the loss leader, because it does have, the, in theory at least, uh, the uh, infinite, infinite uh, financial resources. Uh, I mean, at least in the sense that it can always create dollars or euros, whatever. I mean, obviously, there are political constraints, but it's a, it's a much more natural role for the state to play than, say, a private company. I, I agree with you. I think the interplay is important mm -hmm. uh, because the state is not all-knowing. Uh, it's good to have that market competition to sort out good ideas from, from bad ideas. And as you were saying, um, a lot of countries, particularly in Europe, uh, are still under extreme budgetary pressure. We've seen public support for R&D in Europe decline or not reach its pre-crisis levels because of the budgetary pressures. And, and, and these are, of course, politically imposed pressures as opposed to uh, uh, w w uh, the, the, the prevailing austerity, which has, of course, created huge problems. Uh, and and, and R&D, you're saying, is one of the, the casualties of this. Yeah. I think, um, to their credit, uh, a lot of countries, when we just went into the crisis, had a stimulus plan. Within that stimulus plan, for the first time that I've seen in my career, they had a pro-innovation elements of it, U.S. in particular, and that kept things going through, through the crisis, which I thought was a very good role for the state. Uh, since the crisis has uh, abated a bit uh, and the budgetary pressures continue, they've reduced a bit. Which is unfortunate because it does provide a working model. Um, Andrew Wyckoff, thank you very much for joining me today. It's great always to share your uh, thoughts with our audience, and it's most appreciated you came to us today. Thank you very much.